Okay, let's get started. Um, so before I begin, I'm just going to introduce um, Factory and the Ink and the workshop. Um, so hello everybody, thank you for attending our at home art documentation workshop. My name is Christina and I'm Factory Media Center's operations coordinator. Um, before we begin, I would like to take the time to acknowledge that the land of present day Hamilton is situated on the shared ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg to peacefully share, care, and preserve the resources around the lake, Great Lakes for years to come. If you're interested in getting involved um, with this work, please check out what's currently going on at 1492 Land Back Lane, about 20 minutes away from Hamilton. The land defenders are currently collecting donations to help towards bail funds, and they occasionally ask for um, things like car sharing rides, donations of supplies, um, or just people to help out over there. As a community not for Profit Artist Run Center, Factory is committed to active ongoing reconciliation in collaboration with Indigenous peoples in our community. If you haven't heard of Factory before, we are a media arts center in Hamilton, Ontario. We host exhibitions, screenings, um, provide multimedia equipment, studio space, and skill development workshops for local artists and independent filmmakers. Our workshop partner for today is also the Hamilton Artists Inc. Um, so the Inc. is an artist-run center also in Hamilton, which empowers artists of all career levels to take risks with their contemporary visual arts practices and present their work in a critical context. They present exhibitions, publications, special projects, um, offer education and mentorship opportunities, and facilitate regional and national dialogue. Um, this workshop is made possible through the operating funders of the Factory Media Center, I would like to thank the Insight Foundation for the Arts, City of Hamilton, Ontario Arts Council, and Canada Council for the Arts for making our programs possible. Um, today's program is currently live streaming, streaming to both the Hamilton Artists Inc. and Factory Media Center Facebook accounts. Um, if you have any questions during the workshop at all, please put them in the chat um, and we'll have a short Q&A session at the end we'll, where we will try to address as many as possible. Um, now, finally, Natalie Hunter is our facilitator today. Um, so Natalie is a Canadian artist who grew up in Hamilton, Ontario. She holds an MFA from the University of Waterloo and a Bachelor of Art in Visual Art with a concentration in curatorial studies from Brock University. She has shown her work in Canada and the United States in numerous exhibitions, and she is the recipient of several awards, including the Ontario Arts Council Visual Artist Creation and Project Grants, and Canada Council for the Arts Research and Creation Grant. Natalie Hunter lives and works in Hamilton and teaches sessionally at the University in Waterloo. Um, and now I'll hand it off to Natalie to begin. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, okay. thanks Christina for that introduction. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Christina Durka and Abadar who's over at the Hamilton Artists Inc for inviting me to do this uh, workshop. Um, I think Abadar actually invited me to do this a few months ago and it just didn't work out. But I'm actually at the Factory Media Center here and Christina is just over on the other side of the room. <laughs> so, so we're together in the same space um, and we put together this uh, workshop for you. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, documenting your work um, for those of you who have limited resources at your disposal. Um, so hello to Factory Media Center members and Hamilton Artists Inc members, and welcome to this socially distanced workshop. Um, normally a workshop is very participatory and I would have loved to have some of you in the space with some lighting kits and um, have your work on hand so you can learn a bit about what works best for your work um, for in terms of lighting and how to document it, but um, it's safer for now through Zoom. Um, so it's important to note that this workshop is best for students who are taking art classes from home. So maybe you have some art classes and you're not really sure how to document your work um, with, to the best of your ability to hand into your professors. Recent graduates, I know it can be tough. 
when you've lost access to um, important facilities that you once had as a student and equipment. Um, so that hopefully this workshop will help you, emerging artists and artists without um, access to photography equipment. We'll be looking at options for 2D and 3D documentation, some lighting basics, um, some unconventional materials that you can use, um, that you can find at home, um, file formats um, that, to deal with on your phone, um, preparing your files and documentation for proposals, and then doing some basic edits on your phone. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that um, you will be giving your documentation to complete strangers who know nothing about you um, and who are seeing your work for the first time. So it's important to represent your work um, to the best of your ability um, as best you can. Um, and since we're in a pandemic, um, our tools and resources are kind of limited right now. So we have to embrace the art of making do. Sometimes that means using our um, smartphone cameras, which as an instructor, I'm always telling my students to go the extra mile and use a DSLR. Not everyone can afford one because they're actually kind of expensive. Um, but you have to remember that you're in control of how other, um, others and juries and, and panels um, view your work. Um, so we can use strategies to help with this. So some of uh, the use, useful and easily accessible materials that you can find at home or purchase uh, rather cheaply are for one, uh, we have one of these at Factory Media Center. I believe they're pretty inexpensive, but this is just a handy um, clip mount and you can actually mount it to your, your phone to it. Um, so having one of these on hand is really helpful. There's different versions of this. I know you can buy things at the dollar store for like, I don't know, $4 or something. Um, just something that you can attach your phone to to a stable and sturdy surface. Um, scissors, ruler, tape, utility knife um, for cutting up pieces of cardboard or you know paper, stuff like that. Um, if you have the ability to hang your work on a wall at home, um, having the appropriate hardware on hand, plugs, for example, wall plugs, hanging hardware, not everyone can damage their own walls for the sake of their art. Um, so using taping coins to the wall and using rare earth magnets to attach your, your flat pieces of work like drawings or photo based prints is a great way of um, doing little damage. Um, drill and dr drill bits if you're hanging your hardware, your smartphone camera, obviously, if you have a camera that's great. Um, materials that I like to use for diffusers are frosted mylar, which you can purchase at Curry's or any major art store. Um, tracing paper, I believe you can buy tracing paper pads at the dollar store now. Um, and even just white tissue paper works really well. Um, metallic mylar, tin foil, and pie plates or those reusable pizza trays work really great for um, reflectors. Um, and that's something that's inexpensive and you can find at home. Bristol board and foam board work really well also for um, uh, reflectors and white and black or neutral colored backgrounds. Um, we're gonna go over some um, lighting scenarios with um, continuous lights and spotlighting. So, so some examples that you have on hand at home could be simple desk lamps, sunlight, for example, from a bright window is really great to use. Um, flashlights, the light on your phone. Um, yeah, if you don't have a tripod at home, um, you kind of have to, to make do with what you have. Um, I remember I went on a residency and I didn't bring my, my tripod with me and I ended up stacking up a bunch of rocks outside and making this like strange makeshift tripod, but it actually really worked. Um, so you're gonna have to use things that you have around the house like chairs, a small table, a stack of books. Um, a step ladder is great because you can clamp things onto, um, onto the handle. So that's really great. Um, a roll of white paper, or if you have um, a bed sheet, 
um, that's a neutral color or just a cheap roll of fabric um, works really great for backgrounds and backdrops for um, 3D work. And it really helps if you have a second pair of hands to assist um, holding um, screens or uh, frosted diffusers or uh, reflectors. So the Factory Media Center, um, if you're a member, does have a vast library of equipment um, listed online on their website. Um, I've put the link in um, the presentation here. But, you know, sometimes if you need a lot of kit, you know, $30, $40 here for, to rent for a weekend, it kind of adds up. Um, so if you can't afford that right now, this workshop is really helpful um, to help you find alternative ways to document your work um, in pretty inexpensive uh, ways. So what we're gonna start with first is we're actually gonna start with your phone and we're gonna look at um, your phone and how you can record images because you don't wanna start with recording bad images. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that your flash is turned off. Um, flashes are good for some things, not necessarily great for documenting photographs or documenting um, your work. So you wanna make sure that your smartphone camera is um, taking user-friendly images and the highest quality um, that your phone camera can capture. So that's usually a JPEG. Um, on Apple phones, I have an iPhone 7 and I've learned the hard way that you need to make sure that you're putting it on the most compatible setting, which takes um, JPEG, um, photo images. You don't want to put it on the high efficiency setting, which is which is HEVC um, or HEIF, because sometimes those images aren't compatible with older software systems and you won't be able to actually open them on other computers. Um, you'll only be able to use them on your phone. Um, so you want to be able to make sure that your images are compatible and the most compatible that your phone can take is a JPEG image. Um, so the menu is in the slide. So definitely look at how your camera is formatted. You also want to make a specific folder for your images um, so that you can easily find them. Um, you can organize them. You're probably going to take a lot um, for each documentation image. So you want to make sure that they're not getting lost and you just want to be organized. Also, no filters. This is an instance where you don't wanna be adding filters, either the stock filters on your phone, or you don't wanna be putting them through Instagram and putting a filter on it and then saving it um, because it takes away from the quality of your work. You want your work to stand out um, and speak for itself. Um, so no filters. You wanna aim for one artwork per image. So you don't wanna have say two paintings in a shot or two sculptures in a shot. You wanna have a dedicated shot for each image. Um, this is a bit different if you have um, works of art, say that are diptychs, or um, you have say an installation that's composed of many parts. Um, that's a little different and we'll get into that um, a little later. Um, and you wanna have one image per artwork, but in some cases for 3D works, you need a primary shot and a detail shot. Um, so you wanna make sure in the application guidelines that you're looking at that um, for what's required. Some applications allow you some detail shots, some don't. Um, so it's, it's really good to get an understanding of where these images are going to go and for what purpose and what audience. So, most of you will be using them for you know, your personal website or social media, but you also wanna take good documentation for your proposals and your application packages for grants, um, et cetera. So it's good to have a strong set of images that you can use to build these kinds of applications. So grants, for example, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Hamilton Arts Council, um, I know the OEC has some upcoming deadlines, um, exhibition proposals, so Hamilton Artist Inc. calls for submission, 
and factory media center calls, um, public art proposals. The city of Hamilton has had lots over the past few years. One of them was uh, one of their wrap electrical boxes for healthcare workers, um, jobs, uh, and obviously your personal website and social media. So you'll have to, to look at what's needed for each of these instances where you're going to be sharing your documentation, but you wanna have a good set of images that you can um, work with to build these materials for those applications. So you wanna look at the requirements for each specific call. Um, and you wanna remember that juries will be looking at your images for a couple minutes tops. So you wanna give them the most important information and what they need to see right away and nothing else. Um, so there should be no distractions in your image. One image should express the nature of each work with the exception of 3D works or installations. And just a general rule of thumb for minimum image requirements, um, 72 DPI, um, 1024 by 768 pixels, that's pretty standard for a lot of galleries um, and uh, proposals and what they, they need. Um, for submissions processes, but I've seen it kind of loosen up a bit where some um, institutions just say, oh, as long as it's under one megabyte. Um, yeah, you also want to, to find what um, file naming conventions that they want you to use. And you want to follow that strictly um, because it helps um, the person on the other end be more organized because you could have they could have like 600 applications that they have to go through so you want to make sure that you're organized so a general rule of thumb um, for naming your files um, is you know numbered zero one etc first name last name title year um, example of that is in this slide iphones unfortunately at least the one i have don't allow you to rename your photos on your phone Apparently you can do this on Android phones. I'm not really sure because I don't own one, um, but if you can, great. Um, you wanna keep the documentation in a dedicated album. And then, so you can go back and rename them later. So after you've taken your photos, um, you're gonna to need to get them off of your phone. Um, always, 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 the the best way to do this is a hardwire connection and actually plugging it into your computer and taking them off that way. And that way you're getting um, the strongest, largest file size that your, your phone can capture. Another option is using the, the WeTransfer app. If you can't um, hardwire connect your phone, um, you can sync your phone to the cloud, for example, iCloud, and then retrieve them after. I like to use um, a notebook app and it's compatible with images. So I can send or I can send and store images in the notebook and it doesn't really change the quality of them. Um, and then I can uh, retrieve them later. Um, for email though, um, if you look at this menu, when you send them through email, you wanna make sure that you're sending them with the actual size. So notice that it's three megabytes. So I have an image here that's three megabytes. And that's a pretty decent size to work with in terms of um, having a, a strong image from your phone. You don't wanna send a small or a medium or a large, try and aim for the actual um, image size. Um, and always back up your images so you have them um, for future applications and um, processes. So now that you understand a little more about what you need for your applications. Um, let's like a, take a little, talk a little bit about what's involved in actually taking your documentation images. Um, and for this, you need to really learn about light and how light affects um, your work. So you have two options when you're shooting your work. You can work indoors or you can work outdoors. Um, outdoor lighting, Daylight, but not really strong sunlight is best. So if you want to go outside on an overcast or semi cloudy day where the sun is not really, really harsh. Um, that's really good because strong sunlight will produce really strong shadows on your work. 
um, and in some instances can give you some glare. Also think about the time of day. So the time of day is really important. Um, if you shoot at dawn or dusk, it will give you longer shadows. So that's also something that's important. Um, for indoor lighting, you wanna make sure that you're in a space where you can control the lighting easiest. Avoid basements or like garages or dimly lit spaces. And you wanna avoid artificial lighting situations that have a warmer or yellow cast um, light. You want to have an evenly lit room, perhaps that has daylight, um, or the room that I am has um, fluorescence on the ceiling. So that gives uh, an evenly lit space. You're going to add more lighting, obviously, but um, it's important to remember that low lighting conditions create um, noise, and it's harder for you to capture a good image because your your camera has to work harder the sensor and also um, it's you're, it's easy to pick up more movement if you're in a dimly lit room so I've included a couple of examples below of you know work where I've just used the spaces available to me to document it where light is important in the demonstration in the context uh, for the work. And I'm gonna be using some of my own work, um, some of other artists' work that I have permission to use, and also um, a little kind of export, or not an export, a little um, setup that I've created um, just to show you. Um, so Abadar asked me, can we expand on what noise is? So when you, when you um, take a photograph in a really dimly lit space um, and you pinch in and zoom, it'll almost look like it's pixelated or there's, um, it's, it's noisy, like there's a texture on the image. And that's something that you wanna avoid because it it's occurs because your, your sensor has to work a lot harder to pick up um, details in low lighting and even the, the really strong cameras like iPhone 12s or iPhone 11s um, that claim to be really good in low light situations, you still have to, um, when you shoot it, you still have to wait and it's, it's a long exposure so you can't move. Um, so it's important to do that. Does that make sense, Abadar? Yeah? Anyway, so, you wanna aim for soft, even lighting um, to document your work. Um, your work should be the focus of each documentation shot and you don't want the lighting or what you do with the lighting creatively to be um, the focus of your um, work. The lighting should essentially disappear and you shouldn't even notice it. Um, because it should look, your work should look as if it looks in reality. So thankfully, even in a pandemic, we have some tools around us to help us control light. Um, so for example, we're gonna have to, to look at making do with alternative lighting sources. So this is an example that I set up in my studio in 2018, and I didn't have a lighting kit at the time, and a really, really good cheap option to have in your studio or at home for documenting work, I find is this really simple $10 Home Depot clamp light. Um, notice that I've clamped it on my camera tripod and I put one of those um, LED daylight um, bulbs in it instead of the, the spotlights you would use to say like light a garden for example because I think that's what that utility light is actually for. Um, so I clamped it on my tripod you can clamp it to a trayer and in this setup um, my focus was on shadows and creating latent imagery with the work. So I used a primary light which is the one that you see on the left and that's the strongest light in the composition. And I used a secondary light, which is a diffused light. And it's off screen and it's on the right. So that created a balance where, um, a balance to 
reduce the strength of the shadows, um, but also light it evenly. Um, so you can do something like this really easily at home um, with materials like DIY diffusers and DIY reflectors. So for an example of a, an example of using more diffused light would be this little tiny setup that I made at home using some of the tips that I'm teaching you guys. Um, I literally went into a scrap bin in my father's workshop and grabbed some of the materials that he'd thrown away, glued them together to make a tiny sculpture, and then um, proceeded to light it and shoot it. So this is an example of a diffused light screen that I made out of simple cardboard, simple cardboard sheet. I cut a square in it. I clamped um, mylar to it. And the purpose of using a diffuser is to soften a light source and to scatter light through a, a, a translucent surface. So it's designed to produce more even lighting. Um, here's an example of the setup. So you can see the cardboard, you can see the little spring clamps I had. The lamp is just a desk lamp. Um, and you can see the little sculpture down below. Um, to make your own, uh, Diffuser, frosted mylar is really a good tool because you can buy them in large sheets. Um, you can tape it over a lamp or adhere it to a frame made out of cardboard or wood. Um, another option for creating a diffuser that say you want to keep but you don't have a lot of space. Um, would be to buy that PVC piping, piping that you can buy at Home Depot um, with the little, little corners and just build yourself a quick frame, um, set it up and then you can un undo it all and put it in a cupboard until you need it next time. Tracing paper or tissue paper also works well, um, but if you tape it over, to, uh, over a spotlight, be careful because lights get hot and paper catches fire. So be careful with that. Um, spotlights, so in that kind of situation that I showed you a couple slides ago, um, I was using a spotlight on one side and a diffused light on the other. And the purpose of a spotlight is to um, direct light forward to a specific area where you want to adjust light. Um, using a spotlight, remember, creates strong lights and shadows so it's important to know this when you're using them. To make your own, um, you can form tin foil around a flashlight, which I have done in these two images on the right. Um, I really love that little flashlight that I have. It's actually a clamp flashlight, so I can actually clamp it anywhere I want um, and swivel the head to highlight specific areas of the sculpture where needed. Um, and that's really handy. Um, you can also cut a hole in a silver pie plate and poke a light through that as well. Um, and that helps um, direct, direct light. Um, other options you might have at home would be a flashlight, a desk lamp. Um, you can buy simple clamp lamps at places like Home Depot or Canadian Tire. My favorite option when I was an undergrad, I had this um, little, it's called a banker's lamp and it had a frosted sort of top on it. So I could swivel it one way and it became a spotlight and then I could swivel the top the other way and it became a diffuse light. And I used that a lot as an undergrad to document my own work. Um, and this is an example of what a banker's light looks like on the bottom left. Um, so yeah. Those are just some more examples of some lights that you can use. Um, other things that come in handy to have on hand, um, you know, there's been instances where I've made my own um, plinths or pedestals to put things on um, because I just didn't really have a neutral space to work in. Um, you can make these pretty cheaply from plywood um, and white paint. It's an inexpensive way to make a neutral background for 3D objects, but also 2D objects. Rolls of white paper 
you can get from art stores make really great work uh, backdrops and rare earth magnets and tape tabs work well for um, adhering works on paper to the wall or a flat surface. Um, Ottawa Street isn't too far away. So if you're in Hamilton, there's tons of fabric stores around. You can purchase a few large yards of uh, inexpensive material to act as a backdrop. Um, fabric is really great because you can achieve a seamless backdrop, which we will go through um, in a few slides. Maybe you wanna invest in some simple hardware, like a simple white floating shelf um, or some other useful tools that you can use again and again to document your work. Um, borrow a drill from a neighbor or a friend. Um, I really like having spring clamps, which is, there's an example on this page or binder clips on hand to pin diffusers and reflectors in place if you don't have an extra pair of hands to help you out. Um, and again, PVC pipes and joints work really well for um, making DIY sturdy um, stands for diffusers and reflectors. Um, bouncing light. So it's important to understand how to bounce light. And it's one of the more useful things um, that you will learn how to control light because cameras are essentially um, stupid. Like they don't see like humans do. They don't pick up enough tonal range. So they can only really um, take into consideration either the shadows or the lights. They can't really do both at the same time. So you're gonna have to do that, use light to offset that. And indirect light is best for creating really smooth, even lighting conditions. Um, it minimizes strong shadows and provides your work with a focused environment to exist in. So in order to bounce light um, with a reflector, you're gonna have to make your own. Um, so white Bristol board or foam board that you can buy at the dollar store um, in large sheets make really good um, um, standard reflectors in, for inexpensive options. Um, using something that's more metallic will give you a stronger light. Something like a Bristol board or foam board will give you a softer bounce. So it's good to, to understand that. So if you look in the top picture there, I literally just used some leftover tin foil from Thanksgiving and wrapped it around a piece of cardboard and um, you can use it as a reflector um, and use it to shoot some of your images. Walls, if you have walls in or white walls in the space that you're in, you can essentially use those to bounce light off of as well. Um, depending on how you set up your your work or your 3D work or whatever. Um, metallic mylar sheets, you can, you know, instead of using an entire roll of tin foil, you can buy a metallic mylar sheet for a couple bucks. Um, you can get them, you know, 30, 40 inches or larger, and you can staple it to a frame or tape it on a piece of cardboard and use it that way. Um, if you need a really big reflector. Um, so this is an example of, you know, I literally just took this in my backyard and cast some light on a leaf and you can see the little hot shot or the hot area of light that it creates in front of the leaf um, with using a, a simple setup like that. Um, so making do without a tripod. So if you don't have something like this, you know, that you can clamp anywhere, or you don't have a tripod, you're gonna have to use any stable surface that you can um, in order to um, keep your, your phone from moving and in, in place. You can buy inexpensive holders, for example, like the one I just showed you. In a pinch, you can use stacks of books, um, but you want you don't really want to shoot by hand or off the fly or just hold it um, because even breathing will pick up movement. And if you're in a lower lighting situation, it will be even more apparent. 
Um, so you want to have your, your phone attached to a stable surface. Um, don't shoot it by hand because you will see, even if you try and hold still, um, you will see um, movement. So to create a, a seamless backdrop, and this is mainly for, well, no, it's for 2D works as well. Um, I recommend using rolls of craft paper, white craft paper. Um, the gray backdrop on the left, you can actually rent from Factory Media Center. They do have backdrops, um, but not everyone has a lot of space to set up a backdrop. They're kind of big. Um, so you can use things like bed sheets, pin paper to the wall, white paper. Um, you want to stick to matte materials. You don't want to have, you know, glossy paper. You want to have a matte um, background. Um, another really useful tool to have is a soft box or um, I guess people call them soft boxes or light boxes, but you can easily make your own to photograph small sculptures um, in a kind of manufactured smooth environment. And this is similar to what they do for product photography, only you can do this on a very low budget just with some foam core boards, some lamps and some tracing paper. So what you're doing with this is you're, you're kind of creating an environment of light, for example, for this object to exist in um, that gives you a clean and, and seamless um, way of recording your sculptures. It's, it's a really frugal way of doing it. But let's face it, backdrops aren't always appropriate for all works because some works are rather large or sometimes your work belongs in a particular place because of its context or because of its participatory or site specific. Um, so I use this as an example because I had made these three photo based sculptures and I couldn't even document one of them in my small studio space just because I couldn't get back far enough to actually document it. So I found an alternative space and I set them up um, as an installation um, because it was a more of an experiential work. So it's important to find an environment that is complements your work and doesn't distract from it. Um, and so, you know, the wood paneling or the wood flooring complements the, the wooden structures and the steel door kind of uh, mimics the shapes of the, the windows and, and architecture within the images. So it's important to, to consider the space that you're in um, when you're documenting your work. For 2D work, um, 2D work is tricky because you have to, you have to think about, you know, is it framed? Is it um, a drawing? If it's a photograph, it might be a bit glossy. So you're gonna have to deal with things like glare, but whether it's 2D, framed or unframed, you should have it as flat as possible. And that's really important. So notice in these examples, this is really bad, a bad way of documenting your work um, because one, it's leaning against, on the one image, it's leaning against the wall. And on the other, you're not even above the object and it's not straight. Um, and it's just on a crappy piece of foam. Um, so you want to get rid of all those distractions like the foam and the wall, for example and use a flat table or the floor or an area that's flat with a neutral backdrop, um, soft, even lighting. So using diffusers um, that I went through in the previous slide to create indirect lighting is um, helpful in these situations. Um, so using mylar or tracing paper over a lamp to, to soften the light, as opposed to putting a hard, strong light on it is important um, and anchoring your phone. Um, another thing to consider is glare. So this is a, an image that I shot when my photographs were hung in an exhibition. And to document these, because the lighting, you know, in person, the lighting made sense because of 
of how they were they're lit in the space um, with track lighting. But when you stood in front of them, you could see your reflection and you could see a bit of glare bouncing off of the glass. Um, so I had to, to rig something up um, to cancel out that glare on the glass. Um, so it's important if you have framed works that have glass um, to think about glare. On framed works on paper, you wanna minimize um, you know, wrinkling and things like that. You want it to be as flat as possible. And works on canvas, you need to decide if the canvas is important to the physicality of the work. Um, and if it's not, consider cropping it so that it remains just an image. Um, if the frame is important, so for example, in, in this image, when I shot it, I had to use, um, I think I used a reflector below it so that it would kind of cancel out the shadows of the frames because the shadows were really dark. Um, and it also helped to even out the spotlight because there was one spotlight that was um, shining directly in the middle of the two, two photographs. Um, so using, even using diffusers and reflectors um, are important when thinking about 2D works. So when you're documenting your work in 3D, you wanna consider light and how the light will hit the object. Um, so this is just a shot of a workshop I did with some students a year ago. Gavin, Marcel, Kendra, and Britt, they're working on lighting and notice how they're, they're all, they all have a role to play in um, the image. So we have Gavin on the floor acting as the, a reflector. Um, but yeah, so you wanna consider if you're um, working inside, you wanna consider your lighting um, either from above or the side outside you want to consider your location in your time of day um, and you don't want to have a super super sunny day um, because you're going to have strong strong shadows um, in your images you want to pay attention to your shadows shadows suggest weight and materiality um, if you really don't want your work to have um, a lot of uh, materiality and you want it to be really, really delicate. Using uh, reflectors can really help cancel out shadows. So in this example, um, I have Anthony here and he really wanted his object to appear weightless. And so to achieve that, he used a spotlight and backlit it. And then we have Brody using the reflector and he's reflecting the light back onto the front of the object. And so what happens is when he takes the photograph, the image or the, the background completely disappears, but he still maintains um, a sense of um, light and shadow in the front of the object without um, completely darkening the entire object. Um, so you wanna pay attention to where your shadows lay um, when you're looking at your image. You also wanna pay attention to your point of view when documenting 3D works. Um, so a bird's eye view will place the viewer above your sculpture, making it seem rather small. Um, I would say the best way of um, shooting, say a sculpture would be from the eye or waist level because it it places the viewer on the same uh, plane as the sculpture. And then a worm's eye view, which is down below, um, places the viewer underneath the sculpture and it makes us as a viewer uh, really small. And so in this example, um, Kendra really wanted her objects to feel small like toys. And so she gave them a bird's eye view and placed us as the viewer above the objects. Um, so it's important to think about how you want your viewer to respond to the sculptural work that you'll have in your application. 
and how you want them to read it um, in that way. This is kind of, I find this really interesting. It's from Henry Hornstein's um, Digital Photography, a basic manual. And I use this a lot in uh, workshops that I give my students. Um, and I find the best scenario for lighting a sculpture evenly um, using one light is this setup in, you can see in quadrant four, where the camera is placed in front of the object, the light is placed at a 45 degree angle and the reflective, the reflector is placed on the opposite 45 degree angle. So it bounces back any light and reduces any shadows. So you can see that in this, this little duck here. And then to build on that, um, working with primary and secondary lighting. So if you, you are available to have two light sources, um, you can think of them working together to create um, a strong um, or a diffused light situation or an even lighting situation. So looking at the primary light, which is the key light and it establishes your main um, light source, which is number one here pointing to our subject. And then you can use another fill light and maybe you would put a diffuser on this one um, because you don't want it to be as strong as the first one. Um, and this will brighten any shadows that are created by the, um, the first key light um, and really downplay those shadows. And notice that at, at this setup, the primary light is placed at a 45 and the fill light is placed almost like a 90 to create balance. Um, so that's a really good way of, of um, doing that set up. So here's an example of some sculpture work that I shot for an artist, Lois Sklar. And I know she's had some work at the Hamilton Artists Inc. I believe it was a similar project to this um, or work that was in the next slide. Um, but she and I were in a show together in Shaping Time at Latcham Art Center in the summer of 2019. And she asked me if I would document her work because I was documenting my own at the time. And so, you know, she described to me how she wanted it documented and it was really, really delicate. Um, and so thinking about this, um, if you were to, to approach a work like this and prepare it for documentation to put in an application, for example, you would almost want to have, you know, a primary shot and a secondary shot. Uh, the primary shot showing the overview of the work and how it exists in the space. So that's the top up there. And you can see that it's a very delicate work and it's very hard to photograph. And then having a detail shot that shows more of the detail. Um, in this, she was really concerned about the interplay of um, the shadows that were created on the wall. And that was really important for her. Um, but she also wanted, you know, um, a couple of the elements that were um, distributed throughout the, the sculpture wall piece to be prominent as well. Um, so having a, a setup like this where you have an overview of a work and a detail of a work um, is good for um, looking at um, documenting 3D pieces for applications. Um, this is another example of documenting another rather delicate um, installation. I believe this piece Specimens by Lois Sklar was at Hamilton Artists Inc. Um, and it's a very participatory work. It involves an archive, it involves um, very small handheld objects. So documenting a piece like this in is little images as possible is hard. So I focused on, you know, an, an overview of the piece here. So we can see that we can see the tables and the books and we can see the wall of objects and a detail of the objects um, highlighting the interplay between the shadows and the objects. And then the archive um, that she had developed um, in the books um, to kind of show those three elements of the, the um, work. And this is an example. So using diffuse light, using spotlights, um, providing even lighting conditions, 
um, and using my own tips that I've just given you regarding reflectors and diffusers and stuff like that, I put together a teeny tiny sculpture and um, shot it. So this is, you can see that on the left, the size of the sculpture, it's, it can fit in my hand. Um, but then when I take it over and I photograph it, it seems a little bit larger because of the fact that I've used a waist level or eye level point of view. And then I used diffused light and a spotlight above to highlight the little metal pieces so that they cast the shadow on the floor. Um, so it's really about highlighting what you want a viewer or a panel member or a jury member to get from your work. Um, that's really important. So for scale, if you have large scale pieces that are kind of immersive where a relationship to the body is really important, you might wanna include a person for scale. So in this instance, this is just in my studio. I shot this, um, that's myself in the image. Um, and movement and scale were really important um, for me to document this work. So I used myself and I used a long exposure to capture both movement and a measure of her scale so that a viewer could understand those two elements um, from that work. This is interesting because this was last year in Factory Media Center's space. Um, I had a multimedia installation, Sensations of Breathing at the Sound of Light. And documenting a viewer's experience within an installation can be pretty tricky. Um, so for immersive experiences, you probably want to include a person for scale. So you're not just shooting a screen or a, shooting a video screen or an image of an image. Um, and try and incorporate as much of the installation as possible from a point of view where um, the viewer would normally experience it. Um, so that's what I tried to achieve um, with this sh shot here. If you have intimate works or smaller pieces where touch or intimacy is really important, you know, consider including a hand, for example, as both an indicator of participation, but also um, scale or to suggest the delicacy of a work. Um, you know, you might wanna, if, if your, your sculpture is meant to be held, then you might wanna to shoot it as um, being held or being used by the person who would be using it um, so that it, it, it indicates and gives it context. Um, this is another example where I've provided a, or I shot this work um, with the intention of providing a primary shot and a secondary shot so that you could see details of the work. So notice that I used an eye level point of view to suggest scale in the first image and give the viewer a context of the space that was in. And then I used a secondary shot, which is um, a lower point of view, but it captures the detail of both um, the image portion of the sculpture, but also the, the armature that it's on. Um, one um, kind of really helpful tip that one of my photography instructors from the Dundas Valley School of Art, um, Peter Karuna, he really emphasized this. Um, he said, when you take a photograph, take a deep breath and let it out. And at the end of your breath, that's when you take the photograph um, because it enables your body to kind of focus and eliminates that bodily movement that can kind of show up on your, your images as camera blur. Um, so if you don't have a tripod handy and you need to do something handheld, that's a really um, useful tip to just take a deep breath and let it out. And when you let it out, um, at the end of the breath, take the shot. Um, and you can zoom in on your photos um, and pinch them just to see how, how much blur um, you get. So now we're moving on to more editing on your phone. Um, not everyone has access to Adobe software. Um, now that they've moved 
to the Creative Cloud. Um, subscribing can be um, kind of a, an investment for some people. So you might have to make minor adjustments on your phone um, before you take the images off and use them. So one of the first things you want to look at is your exposure. So your exposure is how much light um, entered your camera or your, your um, smartphone camera. So when you're looking at your images, you want to make sure that you're in a neutral space. Um, you're not outside in bright sunlight and you want to make sure that your screen brightness um, is in a neutral zone. So you don't want it really, really bright and you don't want it completely down to the bottom, just somewhere in the middle. Um, you also wanna make sure that, um, I'll, I'll say this when we look at color, <laughs> but you wanna look at your, your phone's exposure feature and that can be found on Apple iPhones um, under light, under the light, if you would go edit light and then find so again this affects how much light um, is in your overall image so when you slide to the right it'll brighten your image when you slide to the left it'll darken and reduce reduce light so that that goal with using this function is to find a balance between how the light um, how the exposure affects your your lights and your darks and notice how in the images below I've shown you exactly what too little light looks like here. Um, so there's not enough light and too much light completely blows out the white background to the point where you can't even see it. So you wanna aim for something in the middle where you have a, a nice healthy balance between you know, your um, highlights or your bright spots and then your shadows or the darkest areas of your image. Um, and you can use that um, by begin the editing process by affecting um, exposure. And then you wanna adjust your color temperature. So this is where you wanna make sure that your screen, your phone screen isn't on um, something called night mode. And I'm not talking about the night mode that makes all of your menu bars and stuff look black. It's the night mode that, um, you know, at a certain time, say at eight o'clock at night, you can preserve your eyes by switching to a, a night mode so that the screen um, colors will actually change to a warmer hue and take out all of the blue out of the screen. And so you don't wanna have your, your screen on this night mode because it'll affect how you see your images and how you ultimately edit them. Um, so on your Apple iPhone, so I have an iPhone 7, Go to, if you go to edit, there's a function called cast and this um, affects color temperature in your image. Um, and so you wanna slide to rise towards the right for warmer tones. So you can see that the neutral bright white background we have here has warmed up. So everything is kind of yellow. And then left for cooler tones. So the background over here is actually kind of blue. Um, so you wanna aim for a healthy balance um, you don't want something to look completely orange and you don't want things to look completely blue. Um, so an indicator for this would be using your neutral white background um, as an indicator for how color temperature is affecting your images. Contrast, this is another um, thing to look at. You don't want your images to be super contrasting. Um, so I like to work with my shadows and my highlights independently from each other um, so that I can have more control over how the lights and the darks function. Um, so you want it for the highlights, you wanna pay more attention to the, the hot spot, the hot spots in your age with which are the brighter areas and you wanna adjust specifically for those areas by sliding left or right, meaning that nothing looks crooked or off or out of place. So if you're photographing a painting, for example, um, you want to make sure that um, the corners of your image are at a 90 degree and they're not kind of off kilter because that can be really distracting for a panel or a jury who's looking at your work for the first time. Um, so using the rotate function, which is at the bottom of your edit screen in the crop feature, 
really helps to, to balance this. Um, you can use the tabs in the corners to, to drag in specific areas, or you can pinch and zoom um, to crop. Um, yeah, so those are some tips on just doing it on right on your phone, but maybe you want to have I don't know, another app or something to, to use to edit your photos. And I have some, some options. Um, a new one that I haven't tried yet is Adobe Photoshop camera. And I'm kind of hesitant about this app because it, it seems very like AI heavy, very spectacle heavy. So if you use something like this, use it only to adjust for contrast and color cast and tone and exposure. Stay away from all of the, the kitschy filters and effects. Um, if you subscribe to Adobe CC, the Creative Cloud, and you have a membership um, using Photoshop Express and the Lightroom app um, is helpful. And it takes a lot of um, Photoshop and Lightroom um, you know, basic tools into the app so that you can use them as simple sliders, um, which is really handy, but it's not free. You can get a free trial, um, but it's more for people who already have Adobe and they, they, you can edit right on your phone or your tablet. Um, one app that I like that I've used in the past is, it's pretty simple called SnapSpeed. And it's pretty selective in that it allows you to adjust um, specific areas of your image and it also focuses on you know contrast and exposure and cropping and all that. Um, Afterlight Photo Editor is another um, you know free app. Snap Speed is also free um, where you can adjust contrast and color temperature and cropping but it does come with artsy filters and stuff so stay away from all the artsy stuff um, or if you're a traditionalist like me you can take your images right off your phone. You don't even have to edit them and you can use your own computer. And even the simple Mac photo editor or the simple PC photo editor will let you crop images and make you know, basic um, adjustments to what you need. Um, so putting in this little bit of effort um, to get some pretty good documentation photographs of your work will help strengthen your portfolio for exhibition proposals and grant applications. Um, and it will pay off in the long run. So definitely um, take a look at some of the, the things that I shared with you. You know, I'm not a, a commercial photographer. I'm not, uh, you know, a professional by any means. I'm an artist and I, I've learned over the years um, through trial and error how to document my work and how what works and what doesn't. And so if something like that can help you in your quest to document um, strong images of your work, then great. So thank you for tuning in um, and stay well and healthy, everyone. Um, Christina and Abadar, if there's any questions, um, I don't know if there's any questions, you can just shoot them my way. And I think I have my chat features gone, so I'll have to bring that back. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natalie. <laughs> I know that was a lot and I talk really fast, but <laughs> so if there's any questions, just shoot. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I'm just going to wait um, to see if there's any questions that pop up in the chat. Yeah. Um, but once again, thank you so much for, for doing this, Natalie. Um, this presentation was like super informative and content heavy. Um, and it was Sorry. probably so no, 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 it was probably so challenging to put all of this together since there's not one perfect way to like do something yourself. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like, that's not a bad thing at all. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, there isn't a perfect situation for every artwork. Like you kind of have to assess what you need to do to properly document your artwork, you know, based on how how you know your artwork and what you want to communicate through a documented image. Mm -hmm. um, and so using some of these tips and tools can sort of help you go in the right direction, I guess, or at least that's my hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
We have a few, a few comments and questions. Okay. Um, honestly, the first comments from me, <laughs> I had no idea that the night mode on the iPhone impacted the camera and the camera capturing, um, that's like so sneaky of Apple. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't affect how you capture it per se, but when the night mode feature is on, it affects how you see it because right. it, it changes the color values in the screen to, to more yellow because it kind of cancels out blue light. So when you look at it, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, my image is totally yellow. And then you're gonna edit it, you know, and then the next day, the what you thought was I'm just adding more blue tones into my image to even it out you're going to look at this and be like why is my image purple because of, of how the screen affected how you saw the image right so kind of like learning how your cell phone captures images kind of helps too yeah um there's a lot of comments saying people love Snapseed. It's their favorite. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, use it a lot. Um, do you have any favorite in-browser editors? So I'm assuming um, other than Adobe, if there's any in-browser editors that you can use on your desktop. Hmm. I've only ever used just like my simple Mac photo editor, mainly because I teach Photoshop and Illustrator to students. So that's pretty heavy and Lightroom. I know you can get, I think you can get a free Lightroom, but if anyone in the chats have any, you know, favorite in browser editors that are free, um, by all means shoot them out and then Christina can relay. But I don't really use anything other than Adobe just because like I, I teach it, right? So yeah. We have a comment that there's something called GIMP. Um, you do have to download that one, um, but I know of Photo P. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like Photoshop in, on your desktop. Uh, that's really good, honestly. Yeah, um, I heard, I've heard of GIMP, I've heard of GIMP, yeah. 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 But I've never used it, so. I mean, there's so many free photo editor options now. Um, I mean, just going through the different options that your app um, downloader on your, your Mac has, you can find a lot. Yeah. Um, if there's an echo, we're sorry. <laughs> Chris, Christina's just got her audio on, so it, it echoes my voice. <laughs> um, but is there any other questions or comments? But yeah, Snapseed is really good. Um, there is a question. Okay. You mentioned documenting your work is different for specific situations. For example, grants um, and social media are different from one, one another. Is there anything in particular that you would focus on um, for any specific situation? So I suppose grants versus social media. Yeah, so for grants, like you almost want to, you know, because your viewer is usually a jury or a panel and you have to think that, okay, they could be looking at 600 applications for this one grant, right? So you want to give them as much information as possible um, in one image in a clear and focused manner. So you don't want to give them anything that is repetitive or um, you know, redundant, or you just wanna say, this is my work, this is what it looks like, this is how it operates in a particular space, and that is it. You know, for social media and like your website, I mean, you know, my website, I have so many details of um, documentation of one work, and the beauty of having a website is that you can do that, or on social media, you can, you know, you can even do for a 3D work, you can even shoot just, just a short walkthrough video of, of something and have that, you know, play on one of your posts. So that's something that where I find differing from a professional application and your, you know, say your Instagram or your website. Um, 
your application, you kind of have to get to the point really quickly. If that kind of makes sense. I think so. Yeah. Um, thank you. There's lots of thank yous in the comments and there's oh, a specific cool. um, thank you comment saying, I'm definitely going to try putting together a diffuser and reflector frame with frosted mylar and aluminum foil. Um, That's thank awesome. you. Great, yeah. I mean, you can use cardboard. I mean, a pizza box works great because you can fold it and it'll stand up by itself. So you can just cut out a, a big square and put some mylar in there and you got an instant diffuser. So, yeah. We have a question about whether the PowerPoint will be posted. Um, sorry, I just, I sort of heard the end of that question, Christina, <laughs> something about PowerPoint. Sorry. Yes, someone is wondering if the PowerPoint will be posted to Facebook. Um, I'm not oh. sure the specific uh, file itself, but this video will stay live on Facebook so you can reference it um, after it ends. Yeah. yeah, so the video will stay on Facebook for a while so you can go back, um, but I'm not gonna post my PowerPoint <laughs> on uh, Facebook. Um, but yeah, you can, you can come back to this video feed and, and watch it again. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I think that's all the comments. Um, before we close for today, I'm just going to um, let our viewers know that Factory Media Center is currently accepting um, applications for our winter residency program. Um, we're we're going to be offering um, three one-month residencies um, in January, February, and March. So if you've watched this workshop, definitely consider applying um, using what Natalie has shared with us. Um, and we also have our annual member screening coming up um, where we will be screening uh, members short films um, and audio. So it's a little bit different than this, but um, I think the tips still count because I think this year a lot of people will be working from their cell phone um, compared to previous years. I'm yeah. just going to give one more look over on the comments um, before we close out for today. Does Abadar have anything to say or? I don't think she's there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, this has been lovely. Thank you so much. I think all the participants covered the questions that I had. This has been absolutely awesome, Natalie. Thank you. Yay. Cool. I look forward to seeing everyone's lighting creations and documentation of their work sometime in the future. So thank you both for having me. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, okay. And goodbye for now. Okay. Bye, guys.